I have so many things I want to hit on. First of all, let, let's we've been talking fan behavior today, and so let's just start with that. I, I sometimes guys like me are guilty, Cedric, of we're prisoners of the moment. And I watch these actions and I think, man, these fans are terrible. And then Joy brings up, (laughs) this has probably been happening for a long time, and now you can just see everything, right? We all have phones. That that thing in Philadelphia could have happened 30 times. We just didn't see it. So when you look at the fan behavior, are we overreacting to it? I mean, when you played, was this like every every road trip there would be a goofy fan doing something? Yeah, goofy fan is one thing, but you know, dumping popcorn on Russell Westbrook, spitting on Trey Young and the and the young lady that was uh, in the front row, uh, those type of things, it, it, it gets un- ridiculous. And I think now it's to a point that you know we're talking about it now. You know, we got the NBA playoffs going on now, and we're talking about it and we're giving them attention. I even thought last night in Philadelphia, the guy was hired because he had advertising on. The other players had the other fans they had on jerseys and, you know, you know, fan stuff. This guy had an advertising shirt on like he was just trying to get, you know, a couple of hits uh, and then people noticing that company. So this guy might not have been. You see what I'm saying? Like, yeah, right there, he's, he's trying to advertise knowing that this is going to get played on every national television show. Uh, it's going to get replayed off of phones, all that stuff. So I think it's that's when it's going to get really dangerous where guys are trying to you know, you know, getting paid to run out and do some things. You know, it, it, it's um, I, 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 let's talk about Dallas Clippers. So when you played for the Lakers, that is a winning organization, the culture, the family. Um, there's a certain confidence when you were a Laker that you would succeed in the playoffs. This is what you do. The Clippers um, are different. And so the minute they struggle in the playoffs, the ghosts hover over the franchise. And go back to your NBA career. Was it different in the postseason being a Laker? Because you made the playoffs eight times in 11 years. Does it matter when your history is ridden like the Cubs with losing, gagging? I mean, take me to that space for the Clippers right now because I felt coming into the playoffs after they lost those first two, Cedric. I'm like, oh, boy, the shoulders are tight yeah. with the Clippers. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it's real difficult it was a, as a Laker, especially uh, that mystique and coming in, you start going into the playoffs. Um, you're, you're expected. I think my first round in the playoffs was against Seattle, we end up in upsetting. I think it was a seven. We were a seven seed or, or, or six seed, and we ended up in upsetting Gary Payton and Sean Kemp. Uh, so then that mystique kind of takes over. We end up losing, taking uh, David Robinson to six games. But I think the most important thing about, you know, playing for a big organization like that is understanding your expectations and what they are. I mean, obviously, we we made the transition from the ma- Magic era and then on to the Shaq and Kobe era, and they weren't expecting us to be this. You know, you know the Clippers come in here. They make these uh, transactions, Kawhi, George, uh, they, you know, they, they let Doc go. They are looking for a championship. I don't think our Laker fans were looking for a championship with myself, Nick Van Exel, and the rest of the guys. We weren't looking for a championship. That's why they love watching us so much. But they are looking for a championship. When you go into the beginning of the season press conference talking championship, and then you lose your first two games, it puts a lot of pressure. But what it also does, it brings you guys together. And I think that's what the, what the road trip did. Maybe if they lost the first two in Dallas – and then went back to L.A., that might have been a little different because they had time to separate from each other and not be on the bus, not be on the plane, not be in a hotel room together. Uh, I think it really brought them closer. And then when you're the enemy, you come into dangerous territories because AAC was rocking those two games, three and four. It, 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 it brings you guys closer together, and I think that's what they did. I want to talk about Luca. So he was an international player, and he was very, very young. And I've talked to your yeah. boss, Mark Cuban, about this. So it's how crazy. You go from Dirk, the best international guy, to Luca. Yeah. And, you know, Mark said, there's some things we learned with Dirk Nowitzki we won't do again, how to protect him, how to promote him. Did you know instantly – as a former NBA player, when you saw Luca, because I looked at his video and I thought, yeah, look, it's international. I don't know. Did what did you see instantly, Cedric, and go, oh, oh, okay, like this guy's a star? <laughs> well, first, uh, you know, playing in a professional league at 14, 15 years old—that's what I saw. I mean, regardless if he came over here and was a flop, the fact that he 
made a professional team at 14, 15 years old. I mean, I'm in junior high school at that time, <laughs> still playing with my G.I. Joe, you know. So, and this guy's traveling all over the world being a professional. That was the first part. But then the second part, the fact that I, I thought, you know, I've made the comparisons with him and Larry Bird, and this guy's faster than Larry Bird. He's stronger than Larry Bird. Obviously, he's not a winner like Larry Bird has already proven and done all these MVP things, but uh, he's just 22. But the way he controls his body, the way he understands angles, the way he uh, can constantly can get to the basket or get any shot that he wants, he can't, you know, it's just Luka magic. I call him Triple Doncic because he can get a triple <laughs> double any, anytime he wants. That's funny. You know, I, I was I I love Ben Simmons. I want to talk about this last night. So uh, I years ago they had Hack a Shack. Now it's Hack a Simmons. They want him at the free throw line because he can't shoot. Now he's a great defender. A-plus defender, A-plus passer, great finisher at the rim. But I said this morning, the thing that does concern me a little, and I'm not expecting everybody to be Kobe and LeBron, where they're obsessive and they're off seasons. They literally take a day off, and then they go into the weight room the next day. Not everybody's going to be that. It does worry me, though, Cedric, and I want you to take me into your career and the mind of players that he not only can't shoot, but he doesn't appear bothered by it. Last night, he's like, yeah, it's no pressure. It's basketball. And I think to myself, no, I want it to bother you. I want you to work on it. And, 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 I'm, and I'm a huge fan of Ben Simmons, but he's getting worse. Does it, 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 it's this nonchalant sort of attitude in regards to his shooting. Am I overreacting or does that, is that a real thing? I, I think it's a real thing, but I think with Ben, he's thinking about it and it's affecting other parts of his game. When they hacked the Shaq, Shaq knew, hey, I can't shoot free throws. My hands are huge. The ball is too small. It is what it is. And then his big thing is saying, hey, I made it when it counts in late game situation. But he didn't let that affect him being dominant. You, you, he's making it a point to let everybody know because they know it's 50 million cameras on him when he's making or missing free throws that uh, it's no big deal. So I think that's affecting his play also. I, I went through the same scenario. I think I was shooting maybe in the low 60s my, my first year in the league. I got with Jeff Hornacek, uh, the great uh, Paul Westfall, who rest in peace. And they changed some things around in the summer, ma- made me do some unorthodox way of shooting free throws, but it worked. You know, I ended up shooting in the high 90s l- later on in my career. But I think when you start thinking about it, and now he's not only thinking about it, but he's thinking about everybody wanting him to be reacting and thinking about it and, and show it in his emotions. So he's he's got that two things working for him right now that I think he just needs to avoid. If he makes them, he makes them. It's more important things that he does on the basketball court than make those free throws. And sometimes psychologically, some of the coaches are following him on purpose uh, just to get his psyche going and maybe make him make mistakes on the floor. Cedric Sabalas, the vice president, corporate relations with the Mavs, 11 years in the NBA, a dunk champ, an all-star, got to the finals, 93 with the Suns. So I said this, uh, when Chris Paul has been on the floor and, like, healthy, give me 30 minutes, outside of a third quarter in game two, I think Phoenix has been better. I do not think LeBron at this point can go Superman. I just don't think he can. Um, your thoughts about tonight's game with no AD and the Lakers Sun series going forward, Cedric? Yeah, healthy wise with Chris Paul. I just need Chris Paul the last eight minutes of the fourth quarter, regardless of what goes on first <laughs> through third. I mean, that guy is just dangerous when it comes to late game situations. He's very crafty. He keeps the ball in his hands. He makes right plays. Uh, this is a scenario I think Chris Paul has been in before, but I think in in Game ending series or game changing series, he usually gets into altercations. He got in with the Clippers, OKC, same situation uh, when he was in New Orleans. He get in situations that throw his games off. I think the maturity has shown. Uh, I think Aiden can be a key to this. I always said that at the beginning of the season when they got Chris Paul, that it would make Aiden so much bigger and better in his situation. Uh, maybe not the rim protector. I think the Suns won. Coach Monty Williams once, but. Uh, effectiveness on the boards. Uh, he yeah. can get you 10 to 20 points. Excellent situation. LeBron has done this before. He's gotten in the finals with a subpar team. Uh, even though, you know, you had uh, Love on that team when he went to Cleveland, and then also you had Shaq and Ogowskis on that team. Uh, but they weren't at the best level as AD. But I think he's going to need AD maybe game six and seven to get throughout the Suns. Tonight, I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. 
What a pleasure. Cedric Sabalos, former NBA All-Star, now Vice President of the Dallas Mavericks. Say hi to Mark Cuban. Loved having you on the show, Cedric. You're always a gift for us, and thank you again. Anytime. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.